Hello, friends, and we are so glad that you've joined us for our Sabbath School lesson, Standing for the Truth. It's lesson number four in this quarter's study on the Great Controversy theme. What a super theme. We were just talking about that, that whole phrase, the Great Controversy, and how timeless it is and how insignificant it is, especially for us today. We are just wanting to remind you that if you'd like to get the Sabbath School quarterly notes from each one of our panelists, your panelists, you can do that by emailing us at ssp at 3abn.org. That's ssp at 3abn.org. That's Sabbath School panel is ssp at 3abn.org. Before we get started, let me introduce our panel, your panel, and our 3ABN family. To my immediate left is Pastor John Denzi. Pastor James, I have Monday. Light vanquishes the darkness. Light vanquishes the darkness. Super. And to your left is Jill Marconi. Thank you, Pastor James. I have Tuesday, Courage to Stand. Amen. And to your left, we have Jason Bradley. Thank you, Pastor Rafferty. We're going to learn a little bit about some good trouble. I have uh, Wednesday's lesson, the morning star of the Reformation. Amen. And then to your left, Professor Perrin. Nice to have you here. Yes, I have Thursday's lesson. I love all these titles, but this one is Cheered by Hope. Cheered by hope. Praise God. So before we get into our lesson study, we're going to just pause for a moment and ask the Holy Spirit to be with us. Pastor Perrin, would you like to pray for us? Yes, please. Our loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask for you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon us worldwide as we study from your word. Lord, lead us to your truth. Guide us to walk in it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm James Rafferty and I have Sabbath and Sunday's lesson. Our scripture reading for Sabbath, our memory text for Sabbath is taken from John 3 and verse 14. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Our focus is going to be on standing for truth during persecution. And we see in this verse that Jesus Christ was actually foreshadowing his own persecution, his death on the cross. And like him, his followers have followed suit. We too have been persecuted for standing for the truth. We're gonna be looking at a number of verses in this lesson. Daniel 7, 23 to 25. Revelation 12, 6 and 4, Jude 3 and 4, Jude just has one chapter, Revelation 2, verse 10, Acts 5, 28 to 32, Psalm 19, 7 through 11, and 1 John 5, 11 through 13. We're going to move right into Sunday's, Sunday's lesson where we pick up the phrase persecuted yet triumphant. God's people persecuted yet triumphant because they're persecuted for standing for the truth and God always vindicates His truth. We're going to focus in Daniel chapter 7, 23 to 25 and Revelation 12, 6 through 14 and the prophetic time periods. The prophetic time periods are identified in Daniel chapter 7 as a time, time and half a time. Now what does that mean? Well, Time is one year times two years and half a time, half a year or three and a half prophetic years. When we look at those, that time frame, it's difficult and complicated until we start comparing it with other verses, prophetic verses, specifically in the book of Revelation. Interestingly and importantly, Revelation chapter 11 and Revelation 12 6 and 14, and Revelation 13, verse 4, all repeat the same prophetic time period, but they use different words. For example, in Revelation chapter 12, in verse 6, you have the woman fleeing into the wilderness for a thousand two hundred and three score days, 1260 days. In Revelation chapter 13 and verse 4, you have the, the the power, the beast power coming up out of the sea, the earthly power coming up out of the sea, making war against God's people for, well, actually it's verse 5, Revelation 13, verse 5, for 42 months. All of these periods are the same. All of them point to a prophetic timeline of 1260 literal days. And what God is doing here is He's repeating this prophetic, these prophetic periods to help identify the different aspects of persecution that were to take place during the Dark Ages. For example, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, it talks about the woman fleeing into the wilderness where she has a place prepared for her that they should feed her for this thousand two hundred and three score days. This is talking about God's church. The woman is identified in Revelation 12 and verse 1 as giving birth to the man-child. 
That woman is a symbol of God's church. The man child in these verses is Jesus Christ. So the woman that is giving birth to Jesus Christ is actually a symbol of God's Jewish church. The Jewish church is the church that birthed the Messiah pre, uh, not pre, but in the Old Testament. So you have a picture of the Jewish church that transitions in verse six to the Christian church. In verse six, the Christian church is the church that flees into the wilderness and is persecuted during the dark ages or that 1260 year period. The first place that the woman fled to was to the regions of Europe that offered her protection. We're talking about the Alps, we're talking about the mountains, we're talking about the desolate regions in Europe that offer protection to God's people as they were fleeing the persecution that was taking place during that time. However, when you go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 14, the woman is given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she's nourished for a time, times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. In this particular case, the woman is given wings of an eagle, which represents flight through the air. In fact, this phrase is used in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 4 to uh, describe God's uh, take God taking his people out of Egypt into a place of protection where they could worship him in freedom and truth. In fact, that place also was a place of economic prosperity. So when we think about the place that God brought his people in the Old Testament with eagle's wings, the new land, the promised land, Cana, we're talking about a place that had two basic characteristics. Number one, it was a place of religious freedom for God's people. They could worship God in spirit and truth. Number two, it was a place of economic prosperity. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. Does God do the same thing when he takes his people to the place in the New Testament that he wants his church to grow? Actually, we see that in the following verses. Let's just take a closer look at these verses. Revelation chapter 12, beginning with verse 14, and the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into a place where she is nourished for a time, times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth, verse 15, water as of a flood that he might cause the woman, after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood, verse 16, and the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. I love this. You know, the Bible says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And we're told in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So the earth represents a place of liberty that swallows up the persecution, the religious persecution and the civil persecution that came against God's people. What specifically is the earth? In Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, we're giving a specific designation of what that earth is or where that earth is. Revelation 13, 11 says, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth the earth that swallowed up the flood, the earth that offered liberty to God's people, the spirit of the Lord raising up a standard. Another beast comes up out of the earth and he has two horns like a lamb and he spake like a dragon. We understand prophetically that this place is a more, a less populated area of the world. The beast rising up out of the sea represents a beast or a, a kingdom of this earth, a nation or kingdom of this earth coming up in a populated area where there's peoples, nations, multitudes and tongues, according to Revelation 17, 15. When we see a beast rising up out of the earth, that's a less populated area. And we see the, in the fulfillment of this, we see the United States of America in prophecy. Why? Because it was to this continent that early Christians fled Europe and found liberty and refuge during the dark ages. It was in this continent where eventually a government rose up, an earthly power rose up that promised civil liberty and religious liberty. The spirit of the Lord was here and Protestant America was born, offering liberty and freedom to all faiths even those faiths that once persecuted God's people, eventually establishing these principles in the Constitution of the United States and its amendments. So we see in the context of Bible prophecy, a very significant understanding or insight to these dark ages. God is ending them by establishing a nation, a place for God's people that was like ancient 
uh, Israel was blessed with liberty and freedom of worship mm -hmm. and also was blessed with economic prosperity. This nation is a country flowing with milk and honey and it's a country that has also offered liberty and freedom to God's people so they can worship Him in spirit and in truth. So the prophetic periods are significant in their, uh, in their uh, historical setting. 538 to 1798. 1798 is the date when we see historically a deadly wound being inflicted and we see this uh, persecuting power going down or into captivity and at the same time we see another power raising up or rising up. 1776, the United States of America declared independence. Of course they weren't independent right away. It took many years for them to become independent through the Revolutionary War and then a second war with Britain in 1812 but eventually it rose to independence and freedom. As one power was going down, another power was coming up and the words were being fulfilled of this prophetic time period ending and of course God lifting up a spirit of protection for His people, a place of nourishment, a place of freedom for His people. So these prophetic time periods, as we look into this uh, prophetically, these, uh, as we look into this biblically, these prophetic time periods are significant. Now there's a couple of warnings that are given in the Bible in relation to these prophetic time periods. One of them I'd like to direct you to in the f f minute or so that we have to close. It's in Luke chapter 21 and verse 8. Luke 21, Matthew 24, and Mark 13 are all chapters that parallel Daniel and Revelation. They're end time chapters. They're last day chapters. And in Luke 21, verse 8, Jesus Christ warns of false religious teachers that would come in the last days and say that time draws near. Now this word time means set or proper time. And we'll talk more about this in a future uh, uh, study. The set of proper time is referring specifically to a time prophecy that God has set, that He has established in His Word. And we're specifically focusing in this uh, lesson on these prophetic periods of the 42 months or the 1260 years, the time times and a half a time. Jesus is warning that there will be people in the end of time who would try to put these prophecies into the future and that we need to be careful. Now, part of this, of course, comes from the Left Behind uh, series, the enthusiasm from that. We also see even last week, I want to share with you that I got an email from an Adventist who was saying, hey, the prophetic time periods are, are in the future. They're literal time periods and we need to, to see these time periods beginning with the Sunday law and taking us through to the close of probation. No, no, no. Jesus warns, be aware of those who put these into the future. They have their place and they have their time. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. We now move to Monday's portion of the lesson. My name is John Dinsey, and the title is Light Vanquishes the Darkness. So I want to first establish light. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, we have this message for us. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Praise the Lord. So when we have the title, Light Vanquishes the Darkness, we understand that God is the one that vanquishes the darkness. And we need to connect ourselves with Him so that we can have the victory that He's offering to us. The lesson brings out a question. What's the warning here and how did it apply to the later Christian church? Uh, pointing us to Jude chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. There's only one chapter. And beginning in verse 3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once, which was once for all delivered to the saints. I'm going to stop right there. You know, God has given to the saints a faith that is pure and a faith that is holy and we need to protect and defend this faith. And that's why I love that 3ABN is on the air, that God brought this channel into the air because the very, the very uh, message that was given to Danny mm -hmm. to counteract the counterfeit, uh, to preach the undiluted three angels' messages, mm -hmm. to counteract the counterfeit. And there's a counterfeit message out there. And by God's grace, we are presenting that message. Moving to verse 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men 
who turned the grace the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so you are given some clues here to help you understand that Satan works through people. Mm -hmm. And as he works through people, some of them may be cloaked as though they were holy, as though they were part of the church. Mm -hmm. Because notice it says they have crept in. They have come into the church and they are trying to lead us astray, lead people astray. So we need to be connected to the light, which is the Lord. I'm going to read from the lesson uh, because it brings something out about this Jude chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. This admonition meant even more to believers in the Middle Ages after Pagan practices have flooded into the church, following what Pastor James said, and human traditions compromise the Word of God. For many centuries, people like the Waldenses stood as champions for the truths of Scripture. They believed that Christ was their only mediator and the Bible their sole source of authority. And yes, during the Dark Ages, beginning with 538, ending 1798, we see these things happening and people stood up for God and they, they had to, you know, we talk, we, uh, we're going to get to Revelation chapter 11 eventually. They uh, witnessed in sackcloth and ashes. We're going to hear more about that later. But notice what it says in the book of the Great Controversy, page 61. In every age, there were witnesses for God, men and women who cherished faith in Christ as the only mediator between God and man, who held the Bible as the only rule of life and hallowed the true Sabbath. In every single age, God has had His people, His people that spread light wherever they went. You know, we need to surrender ourselves to the Lord. We need to be in communion with Him and I tell people sometimes, you know, um, there's a danger in falling spiritually asleep. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are shown that the devil is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Isn't it easier to devour a prey that is asleep than one that is actively and watching as we are told to watch and pray? So let us be wide awake, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, yeah. rightly dividing the word of truth. In the, this is the New King James, but in the King James ver Version, it says, study to show yourself approved unto God. Make an effort. Do your part to present yourself approved to God. And... I would like to encourage you to consider this, your prayer. I'm going to share two verses from the book of Psalms. Psalms 85, Psalm 25, verse 5 first. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Praise the Lord. Let this be your prayer to ask the Lord to lead you into his truth. He has promised to bless us with the Holy Spirit that is going to guide us into our truth. And as we cooperate with Him, He will guide us into our truth. Ask the Lord to teach you. Don't depend on yourself only, but trust in the Lord to guide you into the truth. Another one, Psalm 86, verse 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord. And as He does this, what should you do? I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. So it's not only to receive the truth, but also to walk in the truth. As it says in 1 John, it says to walk in the light as he is in the light. Moving to Ephesians chapter 4, we begin in verse 10. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why would Jesus do this? Because he loves us. And notice what it says, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. It is God's desire that we be edified and become 
like Jesus. Continuing in verse 13, till we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man and woman, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I love this language. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of yourself? No, of Christ. Mm -hmm. And this is what we should strive to do. Continuing, verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So we need to understand that there is out there confusion, deception, and the devil has his puppets, let's call them, uh, people that do this. Uh, for some reason, we don't need to find out the reason. We just need to know they are out there and be aware that we need to depend on the Lord, mm -hmm. study his word, asking him to guide us into all truth. And notice verse 15, but speaking the truth in love yeah. may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. Amen. We need to speak the truth in love. Amen. And that's why we, what we endeavor to do at 3 ABN, speak the truth in love. And this will lead people to Jesus Christ. I'm moving to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Notice what it says. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So this should be our attitude. And so notice that it says that we should be ready always. How can we be ready always? We need to, as Jesus said, daily take up our cross and follow him. Do our part to cooperate with the Lord because his desire is to guide us into our truth and to edify us and transform us into the likeness of Christ. We need to cooperate with the Lord. Mm -hmm. So be careful that you are not following every wind of doctrine out there, like a butterfly going from one flower to another, and to this one, and I'm going to this, to this person and that person. God has his people, and you should be able to recognize a thus saith the Lord in what they are saying. If you do not hear a thus saith the Lord, because there are people out there with fanciful interpretation that sound good, but we need to be like the Bereans, go to the scriptures to see if these things are true. So, I'm just going to read one verse from 2 Timothy chapter 3, and that is verse 13. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Let's not fall into that. Let's trust the Lord and keep our eyes on Him. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be ready to give an answer with meekness and fear. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the 3ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3ABN.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3ABN.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. So glad you've joined us again. We are moving to Tuesday's lesson. Thank you so much, Pastor James and Pastor Johnny. What a great study. Your knowledge of revelation and the Word of God, the 1260 years, and then the authority of the Word of God, looking at the Word, studying the Word. I'm Jill Morricone. On Tuesday, we look at Courage to Stand. I retitled it, Finding Courage to Stand for God's Truth No Matter What. That's what we needed in the time of Jesus, as we'll discover here, the early Christian church. This is what the Walden Seas and other groups needed during those 1260 years of papal suppression to stand for truth no matter what. This is what you and I need in these last days, the closing moments of earth's history here at 3 ABN, to stand for truth, to proclaim the truth, you at home, to share the truth in your community and in your church and in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. How do we find the courage to stand? 
We're going to talk today six keys for standing for truth. And we're going to pull from the verses we're supposed to look at in the lesson, and I just kind of tied it into six keys. We're looking at Acts. So turn with me to Acts. We're going to find a couple verses in Acts dealing with the early Christian church. Then we're going to go to Ephesians 6, and we're going to wind up in Revelation. But first, we're in Acts. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. How do we stand for truth? What are those keys? Key number one, spend time with Jesus. Now, you might think, wait a minute. I thought you were talking about standing for truth. I think, you, you know, you need to be hitting someone over the head with truth. What does Jesus have to do with it? Everything. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this. Acts 4, 13. The Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of that day, are talking to Peter and John. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized what? They had been with Jesus. Now, the disciples went from, remember at the cross, the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus was arrested. And what happened to the disciples? They all forsook him and fled. They were terrified. They wanted to go their own way. They didn't want to be associated with Jesus. Remember Peter kind of hanging around with the servants outside the judgment hall saying, I don't know him. And he even swore to try to prove that he didn't know Jesus or he was not affiliated with Jesus. So we come from that terror to boldness, mm -hmm. Peter and John. And they said, wow, how did they have this? They realized what? They had been with Jesus. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn how to stand for truth, if you need courage to stand, spend time with Jesus. In Christ, you find your identity. In Christ, you find your purpose. In Christ, you find your mission. Number two, Amen. experience Jesus for yourself. We're still in Acts 4, just a couple verses later. Acts 4, 18 to 20. So they called them, this is the Sanhedrin again, and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. So this would be what we call the suppression of truth, is it not? They're wanting to proclaim the truth and they're being told to suppress the truth, don't speak it. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. Verse 20, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They knew Jesus. They spent three and a half years with Jesus. Now, of course, this is subsequent to Acts 2 in the infilling of the Holy Spirit. They knew Jesus. We need to experience Jesus for ourselves. Mm -hmm. I love 1 John chapter 1. Let's turn there real quick. Keep your finger in Acts. But turn there to 1 John chapter 1. Um, to me, this is so powerful. 1 John chapter 1. This is John speaking, and he says this, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. You see the senses are involved? Mm -hmm. Which we have looked upon, or our hands have handled, we've touched concerning the word of life. Jump down to verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. In other words, you cannot share what you have not experienced. Mm -hmm. If you have not experienced the truth as it is in Jesus, if you have not experienced the transforming grace of Jesus in your heart, you can't stand for truth. We can try and it can be a facade and we can think, oh yes, I'm gonna stand for truth. You have to know Jesus and experience him. And then he gives you that strength and power to stand for truth. So first, spend time with him. Second, experience him for yourself. Number three, choose to walk in obedience. We're going over in Acts, now we're going to chapter five. Acts five, and we're still doing this little argument, this dance between the suppression of truth with the Sanhedrin and the apostles who were saying, no, we're gonna stand boldly for truth. We're in Acts 5, 27, we pick it up partway through that verse. The high priest asked them saying, did we not strictly command you, do not teach in this name? And look, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us, verse 29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, what? We ought to obey God rather than men. Mm -hmm. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered. There's no um, suppression of truth here. <laughs> whom you <laughs> murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. 
to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to whom? To those who obey him. Mm -hmm. Choose to obey God, not man-made rules or man-made traditions. You see, at the end of time, it's gonna come down to the word of God or the traditions of men. Mm -hmm. Choose to speak the truth, not what is politically expedient. At the end of time, it's going to come down to the Word of God or political correctness. Mm -hmm. Choose to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit, not the devisings of men. At the end of time, it's going to come down to what the Spirit wants you to do, standing on the Word of God versus the expectations of other people. You could be under tremendous peer pressure from your job, from your neighborhood, from your community, even from people in your church. Choose to stand on the word of God. Mm -hmm. Stand for truth. Number four, we receive his strength. For this, we're going to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Ephesians 6, verse 10. So in the beginning, we have to know Jesus, spend time with him, experience him, know who he is. Walk in obedience. When he says, you need to speak, Jill, I need to walk in that obedience. There's times I know I haven't walked. Times I've been afraid. Times I wasn't sure how other people would receive it. But I want to have the courage to stand when God calls me to walk in that obedience. So we're on number four in Ephesians 6, verse 10. Receive his strength. Finally, my brethren and sisters, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And you might say, that doesn't say anything about receiving God's strength. It's saying you have to be strong in your own strength. Does it really? The word be strong in Greek means to empower, mm -hmm. to impart ability. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it doesn't say be strong, Jill. You got to be stronger. Jill, you got to grit your teeth. You got to try harder. It says God is going to impart the strength and the ability that you need just when we need it most. Mm -hmm. You and I are not strong. He is the one who gives us strength. Number five, my time's running out. Prepare for battle. The next verse, Ephesians 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In order to stand, you and I must be prepared. We have to have on the armor of God before we can stand for truth. The armor has to be worn consistently. And one of the pieces of the armor is the belt of truth. You can't stand for truth if you don't know the truth. Know Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Know the word of God and the truth that's in the word. And if you don't know it, spend time learning what that truth is. And of course, we have the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation. We have the sword of the spirit, the word of God, we pray. The Walden Seas took the word of God, Pastor Johnny referenced them, but they took the word of God. Remember, they copied the scriptures and they sewed it into their garments and they went out as university students or as merchants to distribute the truth. They were prepared. They were girded up to stand for truth. And finally, number six, we persevere until the end. Revelation 3, verse 11, behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Don't stop halfway through. Don't get tired and discouraged and give up. Stand for truth. And in the end, it will be worth it. And you will spend an eternity with the Lord Jesus. Amen. amen, amen. I love that the six points that you just made there, Jill. My name is Jason Bradley and I have Wednesday's lesson. It's titled, The Morning Star of the Reformation. This is an exciting study. We'll begin by looking at Psalm chapter 19, verses seven through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. 
sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. The law of the Lord is perfect. We know that God's law is a transcript of his character, and God is perfect and pure. Now, this part is powerful in, in verse 7, uh, where it says, converting the soul. And, you know, we, we know that change can be an uncomfortable process. Uh, Pastor Loma Kang once said that many people don't want to read their Bibles because their Bibles are reading them. And I thought that was powerful. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Second Timothy chapter three, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Here's a random thought for you. Uh, I, I sometimes find myself wanting to go to the hardware store and buy a bunch of cool looking tools. I mean, you, you walk into this place and it's like a grown up toys, toy store or Toys R Us, right? Um, I want to be equipped with the best tools possible, but here's the problem. If those tools sit in my tool belt and never get used, nothing is being accomplished. Some of us are reading God's word and adding tools to our tool belt, yet not applying the principles contained in his word. And we wonder why we don't have a transformation taking place. I don't say this to discourage you from reading the Bible. This is a call to action for us to be hearers of God's word and doers of God's word. I want us to look at Psalm chapter 119, verse 140. Your word is very pure. So what should our outlook be? Therefore, your servant loves it. We should love God's word. The literal translation of the word pure in this verse is refined or tried. Tried as an adjective means tested and proved good, dependable or trustworthy. So in other words, God's word is dependable and trustworthy. It has been tested and proved good. Furthermore, God's word is good because he is good. That's right. John chapter one, verses one through five. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Yeah. Psalm chapter 119, verse 162. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure Look, there is nothing more valuable than God's word. We should rejoice over the rich spiritual gems found in his word. And Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16 says, your words were found and I ate them up. <laughs> or, and I ate them, I should say. <laughs> that is my verse, because I love food. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. What a, a privilege and an honor it is to be called by God's name. Both David and Jeremiah were hungry for God's word. They knew God, walked with God, and loved his law. And now let's fast forward to the 14th century where times were dark, but light was coming. Listen to this quote from The Great Controversy, page 79. Except among the Waldenses, the word of God had for ages been locked up in languages known only to the learned. But the time had come for the scriptures to be translated and given to the people of different lands in their native tongue. The world had passed its midnight. The hours of darkness were wearing away. And in many lands appeared tokens of the coming dawn. I'm so glad that God is the ultimate locksmith. He can open doors that no man can shut. God is looking for people to be faithful to him and faithful to his mission. 
And as the world had passed its midnight, it was time for the morning star of the Reformation to shine. Consider this quote from the Great Controversy, page 80. In the 14th century arose in England the morning star of the Reformation. John Wycliffe was the herald of reform, not for England alone, but for all Christendom. The great protest against Rome, which it was permitted him to utter, was never to be silenced. Mm -hmm. That protest opened the struggle, which was to result in the emancipation of individuals, of churches, and of nations. Mm -hmm. Wycliffe received a liberal education, and with him the fear of the Lord was the beginning of wisdom. He was noted at college for his fervent piety, as well as for his remarkable talents and sound scholarship. Now, I want you to picture the scene with me. Imagine a hot summer day, the hottest summer day possible, and a man is standing in, the, in scorching heat in the middle of the desert with a snowsuit and a fluffy down coat on. <laughs> If I had to guess, I would say he'd be excessively thirsty. John Wycliffe had a greater thirst for knowledge than our symbolic example of the man in the desert. He had an insatiable desire to study God's word and was a great scholar. Wycliffe was also a courageous man who wasn't afraid to stand for truth. The more truth Wycliffe learned, the more he realized he couldn't buy the error that Rome was selling. Ellen White puts it like this. The more clearly he discerned the errors of the papacy, the more earnestly he presented the teaching of the Bible. He saw that Rome had forsaken the word of God for human tradition. He fearlessly accused the priesthood of having banished the scriptures and demanded that the Bible be restored to the people and that its authority be again established in the church. He was an able and earnest teacher and an eloquent preacher, and his daily life was a demonstration of the truths he preached. That's from Great Controversy, page 81. Wycliffe was a prime example of what can happen when we allow the, when we allow the Lord to work on us, in us, and through us. He made it his life's mission to translate the Bible into English and point people to Christ. John Wycliffe accomplished a lot. He accomplished so much, but his life was not exempt from hardships. Mm -hmm. Despite his difficulties, what did he do? He continued to press forward and share the truth with the masses. Now, the Apostle Paul gave Timothy some excellent advice when it comes to sharing God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, something that blows my mind is that accessibility to the gospel has increased exponentially, mm -hmm. yet we still have people living according to the traditions of men as opposed to the undiluted truth that is found mm -hmm. in God's word. So today, I want to encourage you to stand firm on the principles that are found in God's word. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage you not to fall prey to the political environment and being politically correct. God is looking for a people that will stand firm on the principles found in his word that will surrender to him, that will further his cause, further his mission, and not be afraid to share the undiluted gospel. If you love somebody, you'll tell them the truth. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I want to leave you with is we need to have the mentality of a reformer and not that of a bench warmer. Mm. Mm. Amen. Thank you, Jason. And I know you're encouraging someone out there to go and read that chapter from Great Controversy on John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation, and maybe go further and read a little bit more about him. I'm Daniel Perrin, and I have Thursday's lesson, Cheered by Hope. The chapters of the Great Controversy that are highlighted in this lesson, I believe it's chapters four through six, cover some stories of people, examples of what you and I are called to become, like the Waldenses or John Wycliffe or Huss and Jerome. 
And as I read through this whole week's lesson, particularly Thursdays, I thought of a number of heart-stirring stories of Christians who gave everything, even their lives, for the truth. And I'm not going to tell those necessarily, but you've heard those stories too. I grew up reading missionary stories and have many in my home that, that we read together with the family, with the kids. But uh, all sorts of people have given their lives and given all for the sake of the gospel and their names are unrecorded. But we could bring forward name upon name upon name. Christians of the early centuries, faithful Christians who preserved the word of God, translated and smuggled the, the, the Bible into places at risk of their own lives. Protestants in Europe and England, missionaries, ancient and modern, who went to dangerous places to share about Jesus. And faithful Christians in their own homes, enduring ridicule from husband, wife, children, or parents. And details of these lives have been preserved by history of men and women and children who had a clear choice. When the decision was placed before them, they can either not declare their faith and preserve their safety, or they can go out and say it, declare it boldly and endanger their lives. They chose to speak. They literally often looked in the faces of spouse and children and said, this is more important than preserving my life. Mm -hmm. Family, if we give up this, we lose everything. So I want to ask two questions as we look at the Christian martyrs through the centuries past. Two questions. First, why did they die? And second, how then should we live? Mm, that's good. Why would anyone, first question, why would anyone endure something hard, painful, and perilous? Well, people do it still all the time, oftentimes unrecorded. Sometimes it's nothing that I would, I would think that you should do. But uh, you think about people like um, what comes to my mind is caretakers of all kinds, foster parents, mothers. They give up their ease, their comfort, their, their security for the care of others. Modern missionaries to dangerous territories, I think of veterans. Why would they do that? Well, to them, the reward is going to be greater than the sacrificed. But there's more than that in this question. How is it possible to endure persecution and then go on to your death rejoicing and singing? Literally acting out what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice, Jesus says, and be exceedingly glad. Exceedingly glad is not just... I'm, I'm going to grin and bear it. I'm going to take it. Be exceedingly glad, Jesus says, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were be before you. Rejoicing is a word of celebration. It's a victory. Go to your death, cheering for what you get to experience for Christ. Think about Jesus saying, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. We spend so much time, money, and energy trying to avoid inconveniences. So why would people do this? And the lesson points us to the answer. And go with me to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. And so this is where the lesson takes us to really uh, build up why this happens, why people would do this. And here's the text, Hebrews 2, 2 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, that's Jesus, likewise shared in the same. So Jesus became like us of flesh and blood that, and here's the reason, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. So Jesus has already destroyed the one who has the power over death. And here's verse 15, release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So here are some people who are afraid of death and Jesus goes through death for them to release them from that fear. From the lesson, it's described like this. For these courageous men and women, the stranglehold of death was broken. The reformers, essentially, they did not fear death. Fear of death had been demolished in their mind. And from their perspective of faith now, they said, you can't hurt me. 
You have no authority over my life when I am standing for the truth. I recently had the privilege of meeting and talking with a young lady in her 20s who has now gone to be a missionary to a foreign land, what is sometimes called a tent maker. She has an occupation, an ordinary secular occupation that gives a reason in the world's eyes for her going to this country, but she has gone there submitting her life to say, Lord, I'm going to go where you have me to go to reach who you want me to reach. And it's a dangerous place where she has gone. And she said these words, if I was afraid to lose my life, I wouldn't be going. This is that courage of the martyrs right here. I can't tell you her name. The reformers, this young Adventist tent maker missionary, they have taken hold of promises in the Bible like these in Colossians 3, 3. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is already safe. They can't take that from you. John 5, 24, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. Already has it. It's already yours. They can't take that away from you. It doesn't matter what they do to your body and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. In the notes, if you choose to, to send that email, there'll be a few more texts I've put in there. And John wrote this after he saw Christians going to their death for Christ. These reformers made their declarations of faith after they saw what it did in other people's life. And so for them, there was no risk involved. Not to say it wasn't troubled, uh, but they were cheered by I hope. So the question then is, how should we live? And I've got two takeaways on this. We hold our lives too closely as if to lose money, to lose life, to lose popularity, to lose acceptance for, the, for Christ would be a great loss. At some point, every one of us here on this panel, you watching and listening, every one of us is going to have to give up all for Christ. Mm -hmm. All of us. You're going to have to cast your vote, stand and be counted. Mark 8, 35, whoever desires to save his life, if you want to save your life, will lose it. You've got to be willing to lose your life. Whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospels will save it. This is one of those great Bible paradoxes. You give up your life to gain your life. And everybody who goes through the final conflict on earth, everybody who stands with the redeemed at the, in heaven, they will have made this decision and given up their life. If you're not called to do that at, at this time, ask God how you may practice giving up comfort and leisure and carnal security for the sake of the gospel. Say, Lord, place upon me the burden for souls that I ought to have to be willing to give of what I have to lead others to that assurance of life that I have. Ellen White wrote this in the book, Historical Sketches of the Foreign Missions of the Seventh-day Adventists. Long title there, page 220, 233. And she wrote this when she was looking over those valleys of the Walden Seas. God does not give us the spirit of the martyrs today, for we have not come to the point of martyrdom. You might say to yourself, I could never do that. You're right. You now in your own strength couldn't. But this next sentence, listen to this. He is now testing us by smaller trials and crosses. God has given you opportunity today to say, Lord, I'm willing to give up. I'm willing to, to lay this at the cross, at, the, at your feet, to be able to be used by you. I want to make one other point very briefly at the very end here. The reformers were willing to die because they valued the word of God. Who is going to die so that the unreached people of the world will have access to the word of God? It's not just package up a book and send it to them. Somebody is literally going to have to die to get the word of God into the hands of these people. We now need to pray. We need to ask of God, is there any sacrifice you have given me to make so that I can share this word of God with others? I know there are ministries that are doing this around the world and say, Lord, place upon my heart the willingness to give up my life so others can have the word of God that will lead them to the truth that I now have. Amen. 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 Praise God. 
Such a powerful lesson, and each one of us, of course, has a place uh, in God's work for these last days. We just have a few minutes for some closing thoughts. Pastor James, I, I think we have a message for you and for me in Revelation 2.10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. But notice, be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Amen. I like what Daniel said in his lesson that we don't have the courage to stand for the coming crisis, but today you and I can make the decision to stand for what God has called you to do today. In other words, don't think about the future and say, I don't know if I can do that. Today you stand for God. Tomorrow you stand for God and each day he will give you the strength to stand for him. Amen. Amen. You know, I found Wycliffe's story to be quite inspiring. And so I just want to encourage you to not go along with cultural shifts or, or any error that is being taught. Stand firm in the truth of God. Share the truth with love to everyone that you come in contact with. You know, we've got those books on our shelves, many of us, and if not, uh, you can find them in different places. Books of missionaries. Read those missionary stories. Be encouraged. Be blessed by their experience and ask God, how can I do that here? I have one text I want to share with you in 1 Peter 3, 14 and 15. Pastor Dinsey already read part of this, but I'm going to do it again. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So they have looked at you and they said, your life is different. You live by hope. Tell me why and be ready to share with them the hope that is in, we, in you. Amen, amen. I really loved what everyone had to share in this lesson, beginning with uh, John. Let the word of God instruct us. And Jill, let the word of God empower us. And Jason, let the word of God feed us. I like that. Yes. And Daniel, let the word of God free us from fear. Mm -hmm. And I love that verse in Hebrews uh, chapter 2. Jesus Christ became a partaker of flesh and blood so that he could free us from the bondage of fear and death that the devil has us encapsulated in, in this great controversy. So we're continuing to study this um, amazing theme. Our study for next week is entitled, Faith Against All Odds. It's just gonna build on what we've been studying this week, Faith Against All Odds. So we're looking forward to studying with you again next week by God's grace. Thank you.